Well, the schedule improved slightly. One of the graduate courses was moved to a different time. At least temporarily, two courses were dropped. But not quite sure how that happened, but somewhere between the people said, change these two courses. The order got transmitted to drop these two courses. And exactly. What's that? The Nikki back exactly as they were the two that were dropped were an actual change. Right, yeah. And the one that doesn't wasn't dropped was the one that was changed. Right, yeah. Right. I don't get it. I don't either, but So any questions? Midterms in this? No. Uh, how, how do we know we should take you again? Any grades? <laughs> That's a bad sign. You haven't any grades back, right? You're a blue guy, And you'll find out next week. <laughs> now, does that mean if I grade really hard this midterm, then fewer people will take me? I'll have to think about that. Right? No, I just finished, I spent all day yesterday and took longer than I thought. And I just finished about two hours ago, printing up the server for the class's assignment. So that, what's that? We're smaller classes. <laughs> So in the middle of talking about object coupling, equation and coupling, right? Um, and then when we finish that, we'll, we'll move on, you know, back to, you know, various patterns. Um, and so he, he defines, you know, object coupling different types. Right, interface coupling, internal coupling, inside internal coupling, outside internal coupling, like how can you have outside internal couplings? Um, and so here, here the difference is, um, You know, we have a you have a class, right? Any class has properties or fields, and you've got methods, and so the internal coupling talks about how they're tied together, right? How coupled are they? Not coupled together. Whereas cohesion talks about how well they fit together. You know, do they, they belong together in the sense that they support a single abstraction? Um, so it's two different but slightly related things. We're talking about the how things are tied together um, in both cases. Um, and so we talked about interface coupling where I mean, two objects talk to each other just using their public interface, right? Um, which is good, right? Because then that's, um, the whole point of objects is, right, your classes, you can have public interface, and then in, inside we can change those details, but the public interface doesn't change. Um, and then he, he talks of, 
talk about various ways in which we can decrease that type of coupling. Um, you know, integrated coupling, right, as well. If we've got a collection, you know, we need some way of going through all the elements. And the iterator allows us to do what? Well, go through those elements without having to worry about the internal structure of that collection. Otherwise, we have to do some, you know, null that structure somehow, right? There's a binary search tree, so it's left, right, left, right. Um, well, the iterator is okay. It's just next, 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 right? And so that he talks about these will can decrease the, the form of coupling to the public interface because, well, in that case, the iterator, we're just dealing with the iterator interface and not the internal structure of the, of the object. Um, you know, by abstract coupling, he's really talking about templates, um, either in the C++ form or the Java form. Right, if you've got a linked list, you've got a collection, we have to know what goes in that collection, right? And you know, in C++, you do with the template, and you you specify a pr template parameter. Um, and so this class now makes no some it only doesn't really know what type goes in it, right? We have to specify it, but otherwise the compiler complains. And we do the same thing with Java right now, right? So he was talking about, oh, we're not making any assumptions about the object this container holds. And that's why he calls it object abstraction decoupling. What is it? Well, the type parameter. And then, of course, depending on what your type system is, you might have types and subtypes, right? And then you might define a particular type has these, these properties or these interfaces. Um, so you can perform these operations on them and then various classes will implement that type or not. All right, so we're not tying our link list to a particular type of object to be inside. And so use the idea that it's like, huh, why does someone make a big deal of this? Or is it? Is it is it good or bad? Yeah, it's good, right? That's what's deep, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the, the critique of this, it's like the duct typing doesn't have an interface for what you need the type to be able to work with that class. You don't know. Yeah, that sort of depends upon um, your type system, what language you're in, All right? And um, you know, some type systems allow you to specify this type, and here are the here's the interface that defines what that type is, and then you can use all those methods on that type, and your class has to implement that. Implement that interface. Are you talking about when I say extends? Java is extend. Yes and no. Um, because here, like in here, I'm, I'm passing a type parameter, right? Um, my valve is passing a type parameter, but specified um, an interface that defines that type. How do you know if, say I make I have a template class, right. whatever. It's, right. How do I know if I want to use that class? How do I know what methods my type has to support to be able to go by that class? Yeah, so if you're in C, you're sort of you, you don't. Okay. Right? Um, as I say, it depends on the type system the language supports. So in Swift you can say, okay, 
the type parameter is this, and that type extends this interface. So then your type has to, has to. Right. And then your classes that you pass in, I mean, you, when you instantiate that class, right, with that type parameter, the classes you use have to implement that interface. And why did you say yes and no? In Java? Because in Java, you can, ex we're just talking about classes extending the interface, not the type, right? When I define a temp, when I define a generic class, right, in Java, um, usually it's type T, right? And that's it. You can't, can type T extend an interface in Java? I've seen that syntax. So the yes is. Oh, I can't, I can't. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's not the same as the class extending, it's a type has to extend it. The difference is when you create a, you put a type here, right? In Java, it's like new class angle bracket T, right? And so that when you define it, it's a type parameter. And so your your type has to extend an interface, oh, I see. not not the class. And the class also has to do it, but it, the type when you specify the, your generic class, you have to specify type that extends this interface. Okay. Well, it's selector decoupling. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, an example I created is, um, you know, so I've got some piece of some data structure that I want to display. On a GUI, well, I could embed the code inside that class, right? To you know, display, um, and it'd be better to have a selector which returns the value on a display, and then someone else grabs it and puts it on the interface. All right? Example in your assignment one was you want to print things out, right? Do you actually embed someplace a print statement in a priority queue, or do you just have the priority queue return the value and then someone else prints it out? Now, returning the value, right, um, gives us more flexibility because now I can put it on a GUI, I can put it in a command line, I can put it into a file. Um, Yeah, what does selector mean, yeah? Yeah. It's a very simple idea, right? The idea is rather than sometimes instead of doing it all in the class, you want to give the data out to other people who can. It's a capsule for giving out a statement. Yeah. But do you want your priority queue printing out to standard out? And so this becomes, again, like I said, it's engineering, right? Um, we make a big deal about encapsulation and information hiding, but, and making sure that the object does all the operations on those data, but there are times when that data is used by different places, right? And we may may not make sense for the object to do it. Displaying on a screen. So 
We really want that to be separate, right? And so I need some way of getting the data, and that's one way. But string really shouldn't contain anything that you wouldn't normally get from. So if you're returning count as a string, you should also probably return it as an integer, otherwise people can return a count, get the string, parse it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't want to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> But a lot of times, a, a two string will have internal state. But yeah. I guess it can be. And that's what the two string is usually for, right? It's debugging, right? In fact, that's what the debugger calls when, on the object when you in a debugger, right? It calls two string to show you the value. All right, so an example, yeah, you're counting, you want to display, you know, some sort of progress bar, and you know, rather than having the, the Java code to display the bar inside the counter, we just return count. And you know, there's a accessor which, or selector which gives us the, the value we need to put in the display. You know, we talked about iterator. Um, you know, these are some of his primitive methods. Um, now, what he bought means by constructors, he just means methods that return new objects, right? So. We will call it a, yeah, right, a factory. Oh, it's from the object, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think this slide got out of place. You know, last time we talked about primitive methods, right? And composite methods. Um, when he says when you're talking about coupling with other objects, you don't want to, we don't worry about primitive methods or primitive <laughs> objects. For example, in Java, a string, right? Do we worry about being coupled to string class in Java? Yeah, so what he's, what he's saying here is in some sense, languages come with standard libraries and those libraries, we don't need to do a coupling to them because they're standard. What, he really, what he's really saying is they don't change as much as fast as right your code. But as you point out, they will change, right? That's why the graph is standard. Because that way I'm not Yeah, and you have to ask how frequently will it change, right? You know, Java's been pretty good. I think the first 25 years, they didn't remove anything except there were different versions of Java, but most of those have gone away, right? There was micro Java, what they call it, I don't know what they call it, but it was a smaller version of Java for small embedded things and embedding Java in small devices. 
And so then a number of your standard library APIs are gone because Yeah, and they, um, but for the first 25 years, they did not remove any deprecated methods or classes. The deprecated. Well, but the, the Java people have made a big switch. Um, you know, they kept on getting more, they kept on adding more and more stuff to the Java API. And then one day they woke up and realized that the world was going towards small microservices. Um, but it's hard to play in that world if you're, I mean, your base API is, when you load it in as 20 megs or something, it's like, that's not a microservice. That's, and so then, um, starting Java 9, they started breaking Java into small modules. And, those, and the core module and other modules, but they're not all, all loaded automatically. And you have to sort of link them together into your program. So they, I think that they will start removing deprecated things. Inside and true coupling. Um, now here the issue is, and some people, some people used to argue about this a lot, is like, okay, I've got fields of properties, right, in my class, and then Oh, we say, oh, that's good because we make them private and then from the outside world, if I change what they are internally, the outside world doesn't have to know, right? But if we change them, their structure internally, then all the methods that use them have to know that they've changed and they can modify all those methods, right? Um, and so then they, some people argue, well, I just, Create a set of actors or methods with the properties um, to help isolate the, the methods in the class from changes in the structure or the names of those properties. Right. You can kind of look at the way most people implement classes. It's almost like the whole space where they can have the globals. Right, have right. Their right. Yeah, but at least, at least that procedural world mindset is worked off. Right. Graphs, right. But you still have the same problem. Because yeah. It's, in your class, it's just, you've got the same problem. Right. The positive one is Yeah, it depends on what type of change we're making, right? Um, a name change can be handled, no problem, right? Um, I've actually used this where we change the fields from being stored to being computed. Right, so you can you can that change you can deal with, um, or you decide to take that property and embed it into large you know, larger property. You know, so there are some changes you can you can use this to um, protect yourself against. Yeah, it's not going to protect against everything. And also, it depends upon how. What sort of tools do you have to modify the class? Right. Um, say if we're talking about a name change, right? Well, in the old days, I mean, you get to go and find all the 
well, those names were used, but now these days it's like most IDs have refactoring, right? So I can just rename the property. Um, and that works pretty well, right? So the tools can help mitigate some of the problem that he's trying to address here. Doing the access is going to be like I'm always trying to pass the I can't really do the access is going to So it makes it easy to trace how many people are going to protect the data. The drive files is something that I'm very aware of. By the drive files, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can yeah. Yeah. You know, C plus, if you don't use access. But that's what it means by, right, inside internal coupling. Outside internal coupling from underneath, right? And part of this is, you know, we talk about programming, we talk about inheritance, right? Um, but there's one thing people, Normally don't talk about inheritance is look, you whole goal is right, we take a class, so like I said, we, we carve off this piece, right? And so the outside world doesn't know about the details, right? And so now I can just use it. But the subclass is involved in those details, right? It's it's adding details, maybe modifying some of those details. So your subclass is modifying, I mean it has to know how that parent class works, right? So now instead of having, you know, this size of code encapsulated, you've got this size of code, but you've got the parent class and the child class. And so you have a larger set of code, but even worse is there are different places, right? Because here's your, in Java, here's your parent class file, and then here's your subclass file. And oh, this file is now interacting with the detail inner workings of that class over there, right? And so the more, Subclasses you have, right, the more we get into the problem we were trying to avoid initially by having a class isolate details. Right? And so, um, you know, subclasses can make things more complicated. You have to understand how that parent works. And you have to make sure you don't interfere with how that parent works. But if you carefully define a protected database in your right. database and don't just let the subclass have full range. Sometimes yeah. you expect the subclass to have access to your internal state, like I say, protected. Right, yeah. But I mean, you can have a protected. Interface for your subclasses that's as well thought out as the public interface. Well, the string class is final, right? So you can't subclass it. Um, but yeah, so that, that's what it's pointed out, right? Is that subclasses, right? You have to, they cause other problems, and so you want to address them, right? How to make sure that, like I said, we can have a Interface for the outside world and interface for our subclasses. Yeah, and then of course you can. Uh, using, you know, reflection, you can usually grab things and right so again this talking about coupling cohesion is just people trying to understand what concepts we can use to try and make our code better right um, 
And once you do that, then it leads us to metrics. Um, you know, it settled down, but at one point there was this angst in computer science. Um, we got the name science right. And there was even a time when engineering department in San Diego State um, complained and said that the computer science department should not be allowed to offer a course called software engineering. Why? Well, because what they do is not engineering. We're engineers. We know what engineering is, right? And actually, the complaint went all the way up to the president of the campus, right? It's like, and the state department says, well, I don't care what you say. This is what everyone else calls it, right? Um, all the books say software engineering, and it's part of our standard curriculum defined by, you know, standards bodies and engineers, but it's not engineering. And so it sat on his desk for a long time, for years, and then finally he said, just screw it. I mean, computer science can teach whatever they want, and engineers can teach whatever they want. Um, but it, it came from this debate is, you know, is software engineering engineering, right? Um, and there's also a feeling like, well, you know, why can't software development be more like a factory, right? In you know, a factory, we just, things come in and they flow out, right? Um, and so people, this was part of the reaction to that is creating these metrics. Um, now, Dilbert captured a major problem with metrics. Um, Right, I mean, so you know, the, the goal was we want to get rid of bugs in our software. So, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, incentivize software developers to find bugs and fix them. But of course, the answer is okay, no problem. Well, the easiest way for me to find bugs is I'll, I'll intentionally introduce bugs and then I'll fix them, right? You know, you know, we laugh, it's like, but this happens all the time, right? So that, you know, DeMarco's principle is like, whatever you measure, that's where, we, that's where the effort goes, right? We give you grades, and so your effort goes towards getting good grades, right? Um, that, be, that becomes what motivates the students, right? I mean, um, but the whole point of grades is to sort of measure performance and help you help you learn, right? But no, it's like, okay, just tell me what I need to do to get this get a good grade on this assignment. That's what I need to know, right? Um, you know, another standard metric is lines of source code, right? Um, and so if you start measuring lines of source code produced by programmers, you know what happens, right? you're gonna produce more lines of code. Is that a good thing? Not necessarily, right? Um, and so the goal of metrics is to try and measure something about the software so we can improve, right? But the problem becomes whenever we get metrics, then instead of looking at, you know, what, what the metric is trying to get at, we just like, we just target the metrics, right? Um, you 
Yeah, I remember one time I was going to someone's house and it came from different directions. I I'm like, okay, I just you, you go on Google, right? Google Maps and says, okay, go here. And like, you drive there and like, it says there's a road there, but there's no road there. There's a pile of dirt. I'm mean, a big pile of dirt, right? And like, okay, then I, next route, right? Another big pile of dirt. I mean, they're building this huge freeway, right? And basically everyone I was trying to get to was like, no, they had blocked it all off. Um, I've also heard of projects where the project was for the military, which requires all this paperwork and you know all these checkpoints and like all the paperwork was, was fine, 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 fine. And the person document said half the developers are about to leave, we're behind schedule, the code's a mess. But all the metrics said they were on target and doing great. Um, so, um, I don't know if people will use Eclipse anymore. Does anyone still use Eclipse? Um, Eclipse used to, I don't know if it still works, it had a number of um, plugins you could use to actually run metrics on your code. Um, a couple of them, uh, the plugin. And so what I did is I just load them in and I, and of course you wanted metrics to, to measure something. Um, and so I just downloaded a project from GitHub and then looked at the metrics there. Uh, and you know, so lines of source code, right? It's just how big is a project? Yeah, yeah, the, the problem is what was the line of source code? I mean, do you count the blank lines? Do you count comments? Um, what do you count? Um, and then when you, what's the line of code? Also, you can take one expression and put it on one line, or we might break, you know, is an if statement one expression or is it not, right? And to make it readable, you probably spread it across multiple lines, which should be counted as one line or multiple lines, um, right? So there's, there's some, question of what, what they mean or how to actually count them. But, you know, part of the goal is how big is your project? How many lines of code can, it, can your team produce a day, right? If you estimate that if your project is going to be 200,000 lines of code, how long does it take you to do, produce that project? Yeah. I mean, like a switch statement. Right. But it's super easy to break down. You have some very complex string logic or jar. A SQL right. statement. Really compact, right? That program is probably seen as the most right. program that's been used. Right. Um, and so, Kokomo is a that you know, comes out of USC, um, and, and the goal was, you know, look, a lot of times you have to bid for projects, right? Um, you've been a government contractor with software, I mean, you just can't say, hire me, you have to say, you know, here's, what's gonna, here's our bid, and they're going to, in theory, they then keep you to that bid, right? Um, and so, how do you estimate how 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 much it's going to cost? Um, so, this Coco model says, look, okay, there's different types of projects. Um, there would different level of difficulty, um, 
And if you've got a company that develops software and you've done it for many years and you keep track of this, you've got, you've got a record of, okay, we do military contracts to do whatever, and we've done this for 15 years and you keep track of it. And on, on average, right, it, you know, sometimes you get really complicated things and sometimes you get really hard things, but in a project you get a mixture, right? Um, and so our last 15 years, our estimate is, you know, it costs us this much per line of code and it takes this long. And therefore, we can now try and estimate how many lines of code it's gonna be for this project and then use our historical data to compute, help compute a cost, right? Um, and then, they came up with their formulas of trying to estimate this, and there's certain parameters, and you know they give different values for parameters, you know for different teams, there are types of teams, different types of um, projects, but they really then say, yeah, what you want to do is you want to track your track your team record over time and see what, how they're doing, um, and then tweak these numbers to fit your team and your types of projects. Um, right, so you know, using, using their estimates, and if you need 2,000 lines of embedded code, um, you know, they claim it's going to take 8.3 people a month. A and B are just parameters. What's their value, right? What they represent? Um, there are just parameters we fit to fit the data. Well, but each one has different parameters, yeah, right? Yeah. But also, we we have got two of them, right? So we're we're again. Right, but I mean, you yeah. have a small team with less than requirements. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then also, you you keep track of your team over time. You might then change those parameters based upon reality. Reality, right? Um, does it really work? Well, this research comes out of USC. They they develop it over many years, and I've tried to vet, you know um, validate it. And actually, uh, the person who created the model was Dr. Joanne Lane's uh, thesis advisor. Um, so she actually is an expert on this. We created a model from a very good code that won't apply to other teams. They are not right. That kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, like I said, it depends upon the team and the type of project you're working on, right? And the language you're using, the, the experience and skills of the team, right, are gonna affect this. You now you've got a small team of really good seasoned developers that have lost experience in that domain. They're going, that's a different situation than you have, um, Say a larger team of you know younger developers that don't have much experience in that domain. Is that these numbers are going to be different. Then apply this formula. 
going for the single formula and apply it to any environment? Yeah, it's not going to work, right? Yeah, so the, the goal, like I said, is your company would keep track of these, right, of your team's progress over months or years to then adjust these parameters to your environment, your team, your project. That we would use in the past. Right. And as long as we observe the standards by which they're being used, then it should be fairly accurate. Yeah. As long as people don't change, as long as... Yeah, if, you know, yeah. people know they're being judged on lines of code, then they start, you know, yeah, right, 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 right. 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 Um, so, yeah, there's lots of, pram there's lots of you know, different languages, right? Different auto generated code, um, different programmers, different levels of programmers, different types of projects. There's always parameters. Um, And in any project, right, the actually coding part is, is, I mean, there's other, I mean, you have to do, there's debugging, there's testing, there's, right, all the meetings you have to go to and some planning, hopefully. Um, and so I, you know, I took, Twitter client and written in Java and downloaded it and you know you can just generate um, you know you know for each package it tells you how many lines of code right and then different classes average max per method. And by itself, it just tells you how large it is, right? And that's all we know. You know, now when we start getting um, lines of code per class for method that becomes a bit more interesting. Let's see, what does that mean? We're talking lines of code per method. 518? Yeah, you go. Actually, no. Um, it's actually in the Twitter, right? So I look, uh, you know, like, okay, you do this, you go, I go find. Yeah, and it's big, huge mess, right? But it's out, it's probably auto generated. It was, it was like, but still, when you see it, like, okay, I mean, you want to go investigate and see what's going on there, right? Oh, it's just. It's just a GUI code, right? Where you're defining where all things go, and so it's long, or it's just a big, huge JSON thing, or right. Yeah, yeah, right. And so it's not something. Oh, it's that long, so we we have to go change it. It's oh, it's that long. Let's go see why it's that big. Does it make sense for it to be big? Oh, it's a JSON file and has a bunch of stuff. Okay, yeah, right. No problem. Well, but I, you know, it just, um, it just tells us, oh, you know, large value, large value. What's going on? Let's go look, All right? And maybe there's something wrong, but maybe not, right? Yeah. 
yeah, 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 right? I mean, and so it's just, it's just what's even more amazing is one which is like this big, right? And the average is like that. You know, so it just, you know, that's probably more disturbing than that, right? Because your average line of code is, is getting big. So if our goal is to say, look, let's just look at these numbers and, and see, oh, you know, maybe we should investigate that. Maybe we should investigate that. You know, if that is our mindset, then yeah, it's, it's just a tool to help us, right? We've all written methods are too big, right? Um, and so it's just, okay. But if it's like, we're gonna go and look and see who wrote that code. We're gonna go right in the commit file and see who committed that file. Um, you know, it becomes a way of punishing and rewarding people. You know, then it, then it becomes dangerous. Another way of looking at it is um, you know, lines of code um, in a method and the number of methods which have that. So there's like, like I don't know, 35 methods which have just two lines of code. Um, three lines of code is like, that's a big one, right? And so these are probably some, probably an access for methods and, and what can you do with three lines of code? Not much, right? You know, and then we're actually, so there's probably accessors, and, but there's clearly then, so again, if we use this as a way of just, as another tool to help us out say, where should we look to see if we got problems or issues that we can fix? Instead of lines of code, number of statements, right? Because again, what's a line of code? Statements a little more. Number of classes per package. Again, just sanity checks, right? Um, like you said, some code is really complicated, right? And that code is straightforward. Um, and lines of code doesn't capture that at all, right? There could be 10 lines of code which is just really complicated and hard to understand, and that's more dangerous than it. 50 lines of code were straightforward. Um, and so this McCabe psychomatic complexity is, is an attempt to measure how complex a code is, not just how, how long it is. Um, and so the, there's this formula um, which comes out of graph theory. It's the number of edges minus the number of nodes. Um, you know, plus twice the number of connected components. So let's look at a simple example. Um, so just two statements, one after the other, right? Um, so we start off up here, right? And but we've got two branches, the two two, two parts of the F, 
And then we either go this way or that way, and then we come back to this statement. And again, we've got two if statements there, right? So we can represent these two if statements as a construct, as a graph, right, like that. And so now, um, let's see how many edges do we have? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many nodes do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? There's only one connected component. Um, and so, right, the complexity is three. So far, so good. I mean, And so clearly, um, as the number of edges grows up without changing the nodes, the, comp the measure of complexity gets higher, right? Um, Um, well, let's say um, if you break things into smaller, smaller pieces, in, right, yeah. then that number goes up, right? Uh, as that number goes up, right, remember, we're subtracting it from the number of edges. Yeah, minus right. Yeah, right. So if you know if we've got a hundred nodes and a hundred edges, it's, it's pretty much a straight shot, right? What they're, what they're trying to measure is sort of paths through the code. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so this number really. Um, it's less than the number of paths, right? Well, I mean, here, there's actually four paths. We, we can, four separate paths. We can, we can, right? Because we can just, there's one, or we can go this way, now we can go this way, or we can go that way, right? So we got four, four paths through here, um, and we're guaranteed that this measure will always be equal to less than the number of paths. But it's also equal to greater than the branch coverage. I can cover all branches right, but then after we take a class like this and go back and replace all of this with street replace right, all right, State pattern. Um, can this still be applied? Yeah. In the state, you have to break it out as a separate member of the state. Well, we have to we have to talk about McCabe index for functions or methods internally, right? Um, so they're primarily interested in each method, how complex is each method. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so, NIST, I'm not sure why they, uh, National Institute of um, Standards and Time or something, I forget what it stands for. Um, they have the recommendation that yeah, once your, mo your complexity gets greater than 10, then you want to think about breaking into smaller pieces. Right? Yeah. 
And then, of course, it's, if you can't compute it, it's, it's not you know, what I'm talking about. So, um, right, for a method, and again, it's the mean standard deviation, the maximum. So, like, again, it's like, okay, we should probably go find that and look at it, right? Because that high number, that thing is going to be very complex. And so we may need it that complex, but you want to make sure you test it well, right? Um, and so again, it's just, you know, if we use this as a way of uh, sanity check on our code, find spots that may need to be improved as opposed as opposed to a way of trying to measure someone's performance which will then lead to promotions or bonuses right and then the other one produces you know graph to So there's lots of different metrics we can use. Um, class metrics, number methods per class, static methods per class, fields, right? Um, parameters per method. You know, so again, like there's some outliers that you may want to take a look at. Now this is number of methods, right, per class in that package. Yeah. Right. So these are screenshots from clips. Yeah. And they just generate all this. And then if you, if you open those up more, yeah, 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 yeah. So then you see, then it gives a per class. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to download those plugins and install it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's. Oh, well, it's part of Eclipse, and if you could make Eclipse do it, probably, I mean. Yeah, but the other problem is you say, okay, if, if we then say, okay, I mean, this number has to be less than 50, I mean, before we can check it in, but th there might be a valid reason for it not to be above 50, right? So you want to be careful using metrics, use metrics to find potential problems that you may go look at. Not as to punish people or to automatically say we should never go above that number. Uh, nested block depth. I mean, how many? I mean, but nested blocks is like, well, I mean, there's a while loop, right? I mean, so that's a nested block inside of this, right? And for them, this measure is two because there's the, the method is a block and then in turn, you've got a block, right? And that number is scary. So some of, the, some of, these, um, some of these methods actually smell. Yeah, right, yeah. Too many lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, it's just a smell effect. Yeah. Even you have to just whatever that was. Yeah, that's what this. That's what this. Negative slope, but that's what this is measuring, right? Is, yeah. yeah. And like I said, I mean, you've got. 
nested eight deep. Again, that we may only go look at that. If nothing else, make sure it's it's right because if we nest that deep, it's easier to make mistakes. Like a cold smell, so you will look at it. And maybe we need to keep it that way, but maybe we need to test it. Maybe we want to change it. But, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, people go nuts, right? It was look at inheritance, a number of children, right? And then we start getting some complicated metrics. Um, So we have a, how many methods are defined by the class, right? How many fields or properties defined by the class? Um, then R of F is the number of methods that access field F, right? And then we compute the mean value of over, right? So the question is, you know, some methods access certain fields, right? Um, right, and so what happens if all methods access all fields, then this mean is going to be M, and so that will be zero, right? If what happens if each method only accesses one field, then R of F is going to be, if only one method accesses each field, then R of F is going to be one for everything. And so this mean is going to be one. And so then this is going to be one minus M, one minus M is be one, right? Um, so this value goes, between zero and one, where one means basically it's all disjoint, right? There's each field only has one method, and the other extreme is each method accesses all the fields, right? And You know, this is probably looking pretty low, but then it's examples, right? So, um, so, so, so we get like a point on pretty, pretty much just how the struct you get as you're not really at right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then, oh, first, stable code. Um, well, when we do this, when we look at the example, we do this directly, right? Then this code depends upon those concrete things. Um, when we, had the code coupled to an interface, then far more flexible, right? Um, I mean, these classes are stable because they're in, just interfaces, right? And we define them and then we don't change them. Um, and so the, the idea behind this metric we come up is like, the more classes you're coupled to, the more higher probability that you're going to have to change because there are changes, right? Um,
And so we divide into categories. Um, in each category is like a, like a module or things that belong together. Um, And so then you define this crazy metric where, okay, um, the first CA is number of classes outside this category depend upon classes inside the category, right? So it's basically we have this, we've got casuals or modules which are like independent things, but then they use together in the project. And if this guy uses something over there, then, okay, that counts. Um, and then we have the, Reverse, right? This one depends on something outside. Um, and so then we define this crazy metric. Um, so how do we get the value to be zero? The only way that zero is CE has to be zero, which means um, our package doesn't depend on anybody outside the world, right? Which means this one is stable because outside, everything else can change, but we're not going to be affected. Um, <clears throat> how do we get one? Well, the only way to get a one is a CA um, is zero. Um, Well, yeah, let's see. What's that? Yeah, but to get. If all you do is depend on people outside yourself, Right. If you depend upon what's outside of you, then you're in trouble. If you don't depend upon, you only depend upon nothing outside, then you're good, right? And then write it and measure this. Nine three is abstract classes, and then there's you know, more metrics we can But there's metrics can be useful this to help us guide us as long as we don't use them um, for promotions or salary raises or bonuses or It's not clear you could do that because, in general, that stuff is not. Software engineers don't determine no bonuses, right? So you need good managers. That's it for today. We'll. See everyone next week.